uh, which I managed to do in the middle of the meeting, disrupting people yesterday. Uh, uh, did you say you've been away somewhere or just? Um, yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's actually, I was at this festival light this weekend. Um, What's that? It's 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 a big it, it, the Institute of Ideas. They do this big um, big operation in Kenwood House in London. Um, right. Uh, speaking, panelling. Uh, it's sort of a mixture of politicians and public intellectuals and and, and so on. Um, and I was promoting my two books. Um, but it was it was a good event. Uh, it meant I was not glued to party conference, but <laughs> I'm 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 sure you managed to survive. Yeah, I did. <laughs> uh, I I uh, read a speech which I thought was uh, very good. I think there's a sort of clarity about what they're trying to do at the moment, which is in yes. I think I think that majoring on education is is absolutely right schools and the voucher approach is a good approach so yeah i think i think in terms of themes the and also the you know the the tacit uh, progressive alliance is is obviously the way forward so no i think th i'm happy with what's happening yes in that uh, <laughs> happy happy with what's happening in in our world i have to say the uh, the, the the wider political world looks uh, fairly fairly disastrous really mm -hmm. and, uh, sort of hit by wave of disaster after disaster what what, what um, I'm going to distract you briefly from China uh, what should be happening with the gas market or, and is um, the, in a state to intervene helpfully well, well, I think it was a bad mistake, actually, to get into um, price fixing. Um, it was sort of Ed Miliband's populist gesture and the Tories joined in. Uh, I don't think you need it. Um, it's, it's proved very damaging. Uh, admittedly, the company should have hedged, but um, uh, it was, you know, it was bound to be designed. Once you get into fixing prices and when wholesale markets are volatile, it's, you're heading for disaster. I mean, the, the one question I don't have an answer to is whether um, leaving the European energy market has actually made a difference. I think there's quite a big price differential, isn't there, with uh, the European Union, but I'm not sure whether the fact that we've left um, has actually made any concrete difference. It's not, not my area of expertise. I see we've got a few people joining us. Um, I'll say good evening to my father, who's looking very smart today. Yeah, well, you too. Good evening to your father. Yes. Uh, was so, a connection with the he, same. He, 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 he shames me by always dressing much more respectfully than me. You're on mute, father. So I can't hear you. No, still on mute. Um, Piers, who's a member of our board joining us, and I see one or two others. We have got a very large number of people registered. We'll, uh, we, we've timed it quite well, I think, in relation to the Lib Dem conference. Uh, I think we're um, following on well, and I, there was some good publicity for the event there. And we're, we're lucky to have... Um, Annabella, and I assume she told you about her, her new role is. Uh, well, she didn't talk about it, but we, we, we had a telephone conversation about this meeting. No, what is her new role? Uh, I mean, if you remember, she chaired the session we did in May yeah. when she yeah. was uh, a news reporter for Quartz magazine, but she's now the breaking news reporter for the Washington Post for Europe. Oh, oh yes, I'd, I'd pick that up. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. Really interesting role. Mm. Uh, so welcoming others as they join us uh, and I see we have Annabelle there which is always a relief good to see you hi hello Annabelle <laughs> not that you're not wonderfully reliable how are you oh you're on mute hi both sorry I'm um, trying to connect on my laptop and it's only working on my phone so just give me a second no problem um, 
lots of other people i i can see you're more than welcome i'll ask you when we start the meeting to stop your video and to mute yourselves but you're more than welcome to reveal yourselves for now connell i see you're back for more for those that weren't here yesterday we had a session yesterday you, you're on mute connell if you want to unmute if you were going to say something lots of people joining us phil good to see you Thanks, Ben. Vince, really enjoyed your book. Sort of, uh, you've definitely oh, got a you. grasp of history, which is lovely because lots of people seem to miss out that bit. Yeah, well, you, you well, uh, indeed, I, I, whether I got it right is less important than, than recognizing that history matters in this subject. And the, the Chinese remember it, even if we don't. The Chinese always remember you. I mean, sort of, that's the important thing. A lot of people don't get that. A lot of people joining us, you're welcome to uh, unmute and join the conversation. I'll ask you when we start to uh, uh, turn your videos off and uh, mute. Connell, you were trying to say something earlier. Well, no, just to, uh, I discovered where the unmute button is. <laughs> well, uh, it, <laughs> it, it's, it's lovely to meet you, Vince. Um, you. I, I'm still heavily involved in land value taxation. I don't oh, know. If lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> and oh dear i might try and call in a favor and ask you to do a forward forward to an upcoming book uh in the bite size uh, series oh, right. i liked your bite size book on china engage mm. i thought that was very good okay. well it was punchy it got me into trouble but <laughs> oh, yeah oh i've seen people trying to uh well, discredit you, but I thought it was absolutely on the mark. Oh, and thank I'm you. Very looking forward to what we're hearing. We're going to hear tonight. If people okay. don't disagree, then uh, you haven't said anything worthwhile at all. I think oh, it's good. Cool principle. Um, good to see others joining us. Phil, of course, you're part of the, the York conspiracy along with Vince and myself. Yes. Um... <sighs> Well, there's been some very good plots out of York, I think. And, you know, as we all know, Richard III had a very hard time post, sort of, and York did. But sort of, no, I, and I, I think there's a lot come out of it. I mean, I think I was first taught about Machiavelli in York, and, you know, that says something about York, really. And Locke as well, and a few others. So sort of, it's good stuff. Mm. Uh, so welcome to all those people who are just joining us. We're just having a, a, a short matter. Uh, Annabelle is uh, our chair and is just playing with sorting out her, uh, uh, her technology, but I'm sure we'll be back either on her phone or uh, her iPad shortly. Uh, meanwhile, feel free to uh, join in the conversation. Uh, Miranda, nice to see you. Uh, are you joining a... Um, Radix School for the first time is not a not a name I recognise, but apologies if you've been here before. You're on mute. And Tom. Hi. Yes. Um, yes. First time. Very much looking forward to the talk. Good. Thank you. Lovely. Well, no, nice to see you. And uh, Lord McNally, delighted to see you at a Radix event. So we're um, just getting a few more logging on and uh, we will be starting shortly. Uh, my Lord. I must say hello to Tom because we were communicating about 9-11. We actually held the Cobden Lecture in Manchester and uh, Tom was part of it and chairing it and sort of 9-11 happened and then we ended up in Manchester having fish and chips, whilst I think Tom was giving comments really to the media really for about the next 24 hours. And, you know, it stays in my mind well. Now, I'm just uh, checking in with, uh, with Annabelle, so uh, hopefully she'll have sorted out her technological problems. I, I haven't, Ben, but that's fine. You know what, let's just do it like this. I apologize if it... Uh... Looks a little odd. I'm on my phone, but uh, it's better than nothing. <laughs> we can hear you nice and clearly. So it is uh, one minute past six, so we should aim to start. If I may, I will ask everybody who's not a speaker, in other words, everybody but Vince and Annabelle, to 
mute themselves and turn off their video, which maximizes the broadband for the quality of the sound. Uh, we'll give you a chance to uh, uh, unmute and join in the conversation later. But uh, otherwise, I'm just going to take this opportunity first to remind uh, everybody uh, that we are on the record, um, that we'll be having a uh, conversation here, but also uh, you can join the conversation on Twitter. If you do join the conversation on Twitter, as uh, my colleague Annie is reminding you, please um, make certain to include your own Twitter handle and Radix's at Radix underscore UK, at Radix underscore UK, and we'll look forward to retweeting you. Uh, with that, I'm just going to make certain we're uh, on Facebook so that people can follow us there. So we are now live on Facebook, I hope, or any second now. Uh, and if you therefore wish not to appear on the Facebook uh, stream, now is the moment to change your name or to uh, vanish. And as I say, anybody joining us now, please, uh, if you're not a speaker, turn off your video and uh, mute for the moment. I'm going to introduce uh, Annabel Timsit, who, when we first asked her to uh, chair this session, uh, was working for Quartz magazine and is now the uh, breaking news reporter for uh, the Washington Post in Europe. Um, very much a expert on uh, China and a brilliant contributor to uh, Braddock's discussions. And we're delighted to have you back and uh, chairing for us today. And I think you're going to lead us through our discussion. So with no further ado, Annabelle. Thank you, Ben, and I'm really glad to be here again. And thank you, Vince, for agreeing to uh, spend this hour with us to discuss your book, uh, The Chinese Conundrum, which I hope that many of you in the audience whom I can't see, I apologize because I'm on my phone, um, but I hope that many of you will have pre-ordered it and um, will be reading it and engaging in lively discussion about it in the coming weeks. So I think for the purposes of this particular conversation, um, we will obviously engage with some of the themes of the book, but since I uh, presume that many of you haven't had the chance that I had to read a, an advanced copy, I won't go too much into detail uh, about it, just enough to get you all interested. Um, but we will talk also about current events um, related to China and to the UK-China relationship. There's obviously been a lot of things that have happened recently, um, and so we'll address all of those. Uh, Vince, I think if it's all right with you, uh, I will just start up front by addressing the elephant in the room. Um, especially in recent weeks and months, you've been at odds with the leadership of the Liberal Democratic Party uh, over the question of whether China's treatment of the Uyghurs qualifies as genocide. You believe it doesn't. Uh, I'll quote from your book, but you've said this in other forums as well. Um, the allegation that China has engaged in genocide has raised the stakes. There is no serious suggestion that in this, in its narrow literal sense of large scale ethnic killing, genocide has taken place. So can you please tell me why you're so convinced that there is no genocide taking place in China at the moment? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced. I, I'm I have not been there. Uh, I'm not a, an expert on this. I've, I've read most of the literature and listened to most of the comment on it. Um, I, I'm very struck that uh, some very responsible journalists, I mean, I'm thinking, for example, of The Economist in the UK, which could never be accused of being soft on China, is quite strong on human rights, very independent minded, but read back on all the sources and strongly advised against talking about genocide in this context. By all means, talk about serious human rights abuse, but it, it didn't fit. Uh, and I also pointed out that when um, President Trump and uh, Pompeo uh, launched this campaign shortly before the end of their administration, it would appear that the, the lawyers in, in the State Department uh, strongly dissented from um, using this language. And I think, as The Economist put it, if you're trying to identify evil, 
you need to be precise about what the evil is. So I, I've no doubt that that you know there is a very bad um, treatment of the Uyghur minority. I'm not disputing that. Um, don't think any of us are. But that it's not actually terribly helpful to uh, bring factors in which which are not relevant. I mean, just to make a sort of common sense point, I'm not a lawyer. I mean, there are parts of the world, many parts of the world, where uh, ethnic minorities are very badly treated, uh, where large numbers have actually been killed. Um, I mean, examples would be, you know, Indonesia and the Papuans, uh, Tamils in Sri Lanka, uh, Kurds in Turkey. Um, arguably, though I'm not sure I'd believe this particular case, the Muslims in, in Kashmir. Um, a lot of people being killed. Nobody has suggested in China that, that people are being killed. There's an argument about what kind of uh, um, detention is involved uh, and other facets of Chinese behavior, which is pretty bad and pretty oppressive. But um, I think the use of genocide is, is, is just not helpful. And I do worry that when people like me just ask questions, I'm not making any assertion, just asking questions, uh, we're told this is completely unacceptable. We're not allowed to ask questions. Uh, and that actually increases my skepticism. I think you may be referring, at least in part, to an incident that happened um, recently where you gave an interview on GB News. Um, you, you said that you have these doubts. Um, and the youth wing of the Liberal Democrats uh, reacted to that by calling on you to resign. And there was a sort of back and forth uh, on that. Uh, you, you know, said that the anti-China campaign is orchestrated by the far-right Republicans in the USA, and you were surprised to see progressive groups lining up with them. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about these kinds of incidents that have happened more recently, uh, and and where you see this conversation going, both within your party and outside of it. Well, I, I just want us to have a, a sort of open, informed debate about China. I mean, there are a lot of bad things, a lot of some good things. Um, and I you know, believe on balance we should be trying to engage with China. But I, 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 I just want to make sure that the evidence is looked at in a dispassionate way. And I think one of the things which has encouraged me to get more and more involved in this is the, the kind of very shouty, um, tone of the debate. Um, I mean, I quoted in, in the front of the book, there's a group of academics had published some fairly skeptical material uh, about the Xinjiang. Um, and they were afraid to publish it because you know, people are being threatened with tenure and, and uh, other things. And that's not helpful and not sensible. I mean, we're, you know, we're a free society. That's how we differentiate ourselves from countries like China. So let's have a proper debate about it. Um, I would go on beyond the specifics of what's happening in Xinjiang to, to ask the basic question is, do we want our relationship with China uh, to be based, first of all, around the question of how they treat ethnic minorities, which is clearly bad, not just uh, with the Uyghurs, but with the Tibetans and others. Um, and I think we're actually talking at cross purposes with, with the Chinese. Um, uh, when Xi became president uh, 10 years ago, he was asked about relationships with the West. And he said, look, we're not exporting revolution. We're not exporting hungry refugees. Uh, we're not going to mess with you. Don't mess with us. There's nothing else to say. That, that was roughly his quotation. And he was reflecting an approach which pretty much since Nixon and, and Bush senior and others, uh, of accepting that China's internal affairs were predominantly a matter for China, and we should try to build a relationship independent of that. Um, and we've moved away from that now. You know, the, the, China's internal governance is being treated as a as a, um, a matter for us and for sanctioning and so on. And I and I, I, I question whether that is actually properly thought through. And I wonder where it's going to lead. I mean, actually, there are many countries that, that have appalling treatment of uh, minorities. Um, you know, wh where do we go with it? I mean, I, I'm very much in favor of having a deeper relationship with India, but uh, large numbers of people in the UK, you know, from Kashmiri Muslim background would question that. So should we start our foreign relationship with China, India, other countries, 
from the standpoint of um, ethnic minorities within that country. I mean, that, that seems to me the, fundamentally the, the wrong starting point. So, so two questions as a response to that. The first is you cite India as an example, and I don't think anyone here, I would hope not, uh, would dispute that there are absolutely mistreatment of minorities happening in India, uh, but it hasn't been, as far as I know, credibly accused of genocide. Um, you, you mentioned that there are plenty of countries that the UK has allies with that mistreat their minority their minorities. I wonder whether you think of other countries that the UK has allied itself with that have been accused of um, things to the scale that we're talking about here in terms of mass internment and detention and mistreatment and human rights abuses. I'll let you answer that one and then I'll jump well, on a second. Early on in our conversation, I mentioned some countries where large numbers of ethnic minorities are being killed, um, which I don't think has been suggested in China. Um, internment, yeah, I mean, internment is nasty, but I think there are two questions which arise about it. Uh, first is the query which uh, The Economist, amongst others, raised um, about uh, Adrian Zentz's article, which is the source of a lot of the material here. Um, and in the original article, he pointed out that most people are sent to these camps for a few days um, and then released. They keep the hardcore and I'm sure that they may treat, mistreat them very badly. Um, uh, but it's not mass internment, um, except for the hardcore who are retained. It would appear, again, I'm, I, I haven't been there, but I'm, I'm just looking at the different sources of material. Uh, the second point, which is seems to be a little bit odd, which is until very recently, um, the West, not just the US, but the UK, France and others, accepted that the um, East Turkestan Islamic Movement, as I think it's called, was one of the significant terrorist organizations. It was on our list. Um, and they have been involved apparently in the Middle East, in, in Afghanistan, in substantial numbers. And the Chinese justify their action uh, as a counter terrorist operation. Now, um, they may be using it as an excuse, they may be exaggerating, but there would appear to be quite a lot of objective evidence that this is a very real problem in China. Um, no doubt they've overreacted to it, but we have to look at it from that security standpoint, because after all, till very recently, the West accepted that this is what was involved in China. Okay, so one last question on this, and then I will move on so that we can talk about your book. Um, the last question is based on, you know, the, the, the constitution, the manifesto of your party. Uh, you say that you question, or at least you'd like to talk about whether uh, discussing human rights in this manner is sort of the best uh, basis to start or uh, evolve the relationship that the UK has with China. And I'd like to read you just one short passage from the Liberal Democrat Constitution which states, we look forward to a world in which all people share the same basic rights, in which they live together in peace, and in which their different cultures will be able to develop freely. Upholding these values of individual and social justice, we reject all prejudice and discrimination. I wonder whether you feel like these values are a starting point from a UK foreign policy, or whether, as you've said, we need to be more realistic about it. Um, well, of course, I totally subscribe to those values, and I'm a great believer in human rights and believe the best way to demonstrate it is to operate our own country in accordance with human rights principles, which we very often don't. But, you know, the fact is that interstate relationships have to be conducted on a different basis. I mean, I, you know, the Liberal Democrats were party to the coalition government. Uh, we, I was uh, involved as a minister who had responsibility for trade, amongst other things, dealing with a, a lot of countries that were, had a highly reprehensible approach to human rights. Um, in practice, I tried to do something about it. I mean, I, one of the things which I tried to do was to uh, reduce the um, export of bombs to Saudi Arabia, which had been used to use, kill innocent people. And I did succeed in imposing some restrictions on it, which the Conservative government then removed. 
And I mentioned that particular example because Saudi Arabia is one of the few countries in the world that ranks below China in terms of its uh, human rights record on the Freedom House Index. But as a country, of course, we, we deal with Saudi Arabia for trade reasons, for security reasons and other things. Uh, and many other countries outside Europe um, you know, do, do not correspond to, to our uh, belief system on human rights. We'd had a, hardly have any dealings with Africa if, or the Middle East if we were going to apply a very scrupulous um, approach of, of the principles within the Lib Dem constitution. I mean, we, we just wouldn't deal with them. Um, but we have to when you're in government. And I've taken a, you know, what I think is a principled approach, but also a realistic approach. All right, thank you for addressing those questions. So let's dive into your book, The Chinese Conundrum. Uh, you describe in it two different schools of thought when it comes to China's future. There are pessimists and optimists, which you name bears and bulls. And while you don't venture to say in your book whether you yourself are a bear or a bull, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you anyways. Um, so with all the usual caveats about you know the dangers of predicting the future and let's, uh, except that we have a forgiving audience here in case we're wrong. Uh, do you consider yourself to be more optimistic or pessimistic about China's future? Or in short, are you a bull or a bear? Well, I'm more of a bull than a bear, I think. Um, and this goes back quite a long time. The first acquaintance I had with China was 30 years ago when Shell sent me out to do a lot of appraisal work around their big investments in China, which have proved to be very successful. Uh, and I was involved in the planning and the scenario work. And there were people then who were saying this spectacular growth in China isn't going to last. It will all blow up. Um, you can't have a, um, a heavy state control regime combined with markets. It's just not going to work. Uh, but it did work. And Chinese state capitalism has proved a very successful model. And indeed, other countries are emulating it. Vietnam being a, being a case in point. Uh, but there has been a whole set of problems which have built up in the last few years. The dem demography, the one-child policy was arguably too successful. Um, they're running out of uh, younger workers, so they have to push ahead. If they're going to continue to um, raise living standards, it's going to have to be through productivity, which is a different kind of challenge. Um, they've built up um, very serious uh, corporate debt problems, particularly in the property sector. You may see about it in the news today about Evergrande, one of the big property companies. And, uh, you know, unusually for an authoritarian state, there have been demonstrations across China in the last few days, people occupying offices in protest because of the risk of default um, for developers and customers. Uh, so there is um, there is a worrying level of debt in in the corporate sector, um, and, and, and the, the sense that they've been very good at making massive investment, uh, but the investment is becoming Sorry, Vince, we, we can't hear. Right, I was sorry, wondering if the problem was with Vince or with. Uh, no, no, I, I was too, Ben, but I think it's, it's all of us. Uh, form. Vince, are you. Uh, and the, the, the president, president. Vince, can you hear us? Hello. Yes, I'm still here. Are you Are you here? We, we, we just lost you for about a minute. If you if you want to briefly go back on what we oh, missed, I'm sorry, I, don't, I haven't realized that's that. all right. Um, no problem. Um, yes, I was describing one or two problems that were building up. I think I talked about the demographic challenge, the the build up of corporate debt in the property sector, but you know, experience has shown that the Chinese are actually very smart when it comes to economic policy. Um, President Xi is sometimes characterized these days as a Maoist, which is absolutely absurd. I mean, his whole period in office has been around economic reform, introducing you know, bond market transparency, intellectual property protection, things of this kind. Um, and I think on balance, um, uh, experience suggests that the Chinese are 
good at adapting and the, the, the um, leadership um, is economically um, very literate. The big question mark, and this is where I think the bears um, have the edge on this particular point, that, that G's um, lack of a succession, concentration of power into his own hands, is in danger of creating um, serious instability. Um, he sees these powers supposedly in order to push through radical change, uh, but because he, he has not announced uh, any end to his period in office, there are serious doubts about what will happen when he gets ill or, or dies. And that's, and that's undermining one of the attractions, if you like, of the Chinese model that it provides long-term stability. I'd love to get your take on current development in the Chinese economy. Um, I think readers will be aware, um, audience will be aware that there's been a crackdown on the private sector in areas like education and technology in China, um, and that there's a very serious shift led by President Xi towards this dual circulation economy through which China will seek to reduce its dependency on exports. That seems to me a rather important factor to consider when we're discussing whether and how China's economy is too important to ignore. If it's you know, actively trying to reduce its dependency on economies like ours, for example? Well, uh, I mean, it's a two-way process. I mean, the, the, I think it was really triggered by uh, Trump's uh, trade war. Um, for the first time, China's participation in the world economy, which is very intense, the, the biggest trading country in the world, uh, was brought into question. Um, uh, the Chinese responded to that by looking at how they should become less dependent, which is, is a bad move I mean, from everybody's point of view. Uh, interdependence with China makes them dependent on us and us, us dependent on them, and that's what trade involves. Um, and they have retreated, I, I think originally prompted by the Trump um, uh, trade war, and then you know, later in the Trump administration, then with Biden, we've had more and more um, attempts to disconnect, and the Chinese are, in their view anyway, responding to it. So it, it is a, a negative development, um, but it's, it, it's happening from, from both sides. Um, in, in terms of the progress of their reforms and the, and the, and the recent action taken by the president, um, it, it's also, I think, overall anti-business. I mean, there are about you know, millions of companies in, in China, millions of companies, most of them small, medium-sized, ferociously competitive. Um, and it's a kind of wild East environment. Um, what they have been doing is trying to rein in the big internet companies. Um, and that's partly for the reasons in the West. I mean, after all, the European Commission has been fining um, the big internet companies. Um, we've got a, a reining in in the United States with a new appointment to, to the um, Federal Trade Commission. So, you know, we regard them as a problem. Um, they, what is different in China is, I think what's happening is that the, the government wants the big data companies like Tencent and Baidu, uh, Didi and so on to concentrate their efforts on building up artificial intelligence technology, where appropriate semi new advanced semiconductors and this kind, whereas the companies want to do the things that make the biggest profits, which tend to be, you know, easier, you know, consumer oriented things, you know, gambling and gaming and, and the rest of it. So there is an attempt to force these companies to change their strategy. My next question, I think, will also wrap in a question that was asked by a member of the audience, Joe Zemet Lucia, uh, who asked, what should the shape of engagement look like if we believe that China is a strategic rival? And I'll bring in a specific theme that you write about in your book, which is that there are three possible scenarios that you lay out for China's future. Um, you don't back one in particular in your book, and I'll briefly uh, say their names, but I will let you explain what they consist of. One is Davos, China. Another one is China as Sparta. And the third is Ming, China. So if you could please answer yeah. both my question and Joey's at the same time, which is to say, which of these scenarios do you think at least the UK should be operating under, or if you feel comfortable saying which one you think is most likely, um, and uh, what should the shape of that engagement uh, look like? 
Yes, Spartan China is... Vince, I don't know if you can hear us, but I think... Uh... The way I think the West is now looking at China, Greece and... and... Vince, we, we lost Have I you, gone again? unfortunately. Would you mind going back to the Sparta scenario? Oh, sorry. Uh, That's all right. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I thought I had a good internet connection. We're all used um, to this by now, okay? <laughs> yes, I was, China was the idea of which a lot of American strategists are talking about, which is um, you know, going back to you know, Sparta versus Athens, some existential struggle between you know, the forces of good and evil. Um, and it's confrontational. Uh, and that, I think, is the world we're now in or getting into. Um, the scenario of Davos, China, is, is, is built in part on, on the things that they have said and done, which is China wanting to be part of the international system. They want to be treated as equals. Um, they didn't create the rules uh, of the international system, but they, they want to play a part in setting them. And I think there's quite a lot of evidence that, the, that there is, you know, that is the heart of, of, of what they've been trying to do over the years. And I, that, that is, I think, the, the relationship we're going to have to have. I mean, if we're going to deal with climate change, um, nuclear proliferation, pandemic management, um, a whole lot of international public goods, um, uh, in rules around the international trading system, uh, we're going to have to incorporate China within them, and they will be quite bloody negotiators. I mean, I've dealt with them, and they're tough, you know, and, and you know, it does involve sometimes um, pushing back uh, and forming alliances, but accepting that they are part of the system and have to be integrated in it. And that's what I'm arguing for in this book. I think the whole idea that that we can treat them as kind of an alien Sparta and that we've got to confront them and fight them and, and you know, shut them out. It, it seems to be very damaging uh, and ultimately futile. So let's talk about chima, uh, climate change, which you just brought up. Um, obviously, it's, it's a little bit of a uh, pot calling the kettle black uh, scenario in terms of, um, you know, carbon emissions um, from, from Europe and, and the US uh, sort of looking at China and, and saying, you know, uh, reduce your emissions. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, we are at the point in the climate change conversation that we are at now. Um, and COP26 is coming up and it's very much being treated as a last chance uh, for the world to do something meaningful to uh, slow the pace of climate change. And so I wonder whether you feel like this upcoming sort of test for the global community, COP26 in Glasgow, uh, will reveal whether or not we're dealing with a Davos China when it comes to climate change, whether we'll see meaningful commitments from the Chinese leadership on that. Well, I, I, I do worry very much that the Glasgow conference may not succeed. Um, I think, it, you know, it's, China isn't the main reason, but there's a whole lot of countries, um, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Australia, you know, which are utterly uncooperative and don't believe in the spirit of it. Um, the Chinese are crucial. Uh, they, they are the biggest emitters, um, albeit from a low base. Um, they were crucial in 2016 in working with Obama to, to get an agreement. They salvaged the last round of talks. And they've got a very equivocal message because they are building more coal-powered fire stations. Um, yeah, power stations, not fire stations. Uh, and, but they also have a very advanced um, renewable energy industry. They're developing electric vehicles faster than anybody else. They have the potential for making uh, very big inroads into carbon reduction. Um, the worry I have about Glasgow is that the Chinese are now so alienated. You know, we, we basically said these guys are um, a threat, the enemy, whatever. Um, that we're not going to get much cooperation in Glasgow. So I, I, I suspect what might happen is that President Xi will set out his plans to save the world, a bit like Biden, but will say, well, this is not the time and place, and we'll sort this out in a more congenial environment than the UK. 
I mean, there is a real anxiety, I think, at the moment in Whitehall that that's what could happen. Uh, the Secretary General of the UN said something to that effect in his speech at the General Assembly uh, about, well, he was talking about the US, but saying that while the two greatest economies in the world are at odds with each other, uh, it's hard to see meaningful progress on this sort of existential challenge we're all facing. Um, so let me bring in another audience question. Uh, Javed Bashir very rightly uh, points out or brings up the news that an Australia-US-UK security pact has been announced in recent days uh, and asks the question of whether that will invite further confrontation with China either directly or indirectly. Um, well, I'm, I'm not quite sure, first of all, why the UK is involved. I mean, you can understand the US and Australia, they have a common interest in that area. Um, and Australia has something to contribute. Um, the, the whole launch of it, of course, was completely undermined by the very crass way in which France was dealt with. Uh, but no, nonetheless, I'm you know, trying to be positive. Um, I can understand why, given China's expanding um, naval capacity, uh, which is becoming very considerable, that the countries, some of the countries of the region should want to cooperate. And that's not just America and Australia, but um, Japan and, and India, who are th that four are meeting at the moment. They, th I think the danger uh, is we are getting into this rather confrontational mode uh, and you're getting um, the region kind of splitting um, countries like Indonesia, probably Philippines, Malaysia don't want anything to do with it. Um, you've got Singapore signing up to the, um, the, the new American Australia deal. Uh, another potential ally of the West, a somewhat improbable one, is Vietnam, uh, communist regime, but, but very concerned about China. Um, and in a way, I suspect this is, this is going to lead to further fragmentation. I just want one further point about Chinese military might. I mean, it is growing and growing rapidly, um, but China spends 2% of its GDP on defense, which is the NATO average. This is not the Soviet Union, um, which spent you know, a large chunk of its economy on missiles. It was, uh, it was called Upper Volta with rockets. China isn't like that. I mean, they've devoted... 2% of a rapidly growing economy uh, to military capacity. It is very targeted. It is naval predominantly. They have a weak army um, with no battle experience. They have no overseas bases to speak of, just a couple. Um, but there is, a, there is a specific issue around uh, Chinese military capacity in the naval field. And, uh, and I can understand why um, China's neighbors should want to make a response to that. Right. I was going to say, I mean, if you're Vietnam or, or the Philippines, or if you're looking at this issue from Taipei, obviously the sort of 2% uh, defense spending doesn't, doesn't much matter. The threat seems, I'm sure, uh, very immediate and looms probably very large. Yes. Well, t Taiwan is a difficult one. Um, from our point of view, I think, as well as everybody else's, because its status is highly ambiguous. I mean, we, we've all signed up to the idea of one China. Um, Taiwan isn't an independent country. And the Chinese, for their part, have been much more pragmatic in practice than their, their very aggressive rhetoric uh, implies. Um, there are a lot of uh, Taiwanese businesses operating in China. There are people going backwards and forwards in very large numbers as tourists and students and so on. Um, and I think what the Chinese have basically said is that, that they, you know, they're not going to intervene militarily uh, unless there is what they regard as a provocation, which would be Taiwan formally declaring independence. Some people are more skeptical and think they're planning an invasion anyway, but... but um, until now, I think we've all broadly accepted that, that it was a, uh, an odd arrangement, but it worked. Uh, another member of the audience, Charlie Duquesne, asks about the significance of the Evergrande story 
Um, so for, uh, for the members of our audience who aren't familiar, Evergrande is uh, China's second biggest property uh, company. And um, it's, it's undergoing a, a very big test at the moment, which uh, Charlie believes the Western media is sort of uh, exaggerating or drawing a false equivalence with the Lehman Brothers crisis uh, in the US. Uh, would you draw that comparison yourself or do you also think that it's an exaggeration? Well, there are parallels because Evergrande is an enormous entity um, and, and also because the Chinese authorities have apparently decided, rather as the American authorities did with Lehman Brothers, uh, that it's not too big to fail. It should be allowed to go down, which is you know, quite a radical step. I mean, this is demonstrating the, that underlying the, the socialist rhetoric, this is a capitalist country. Uh, and this is a company that's going to be allowed to go to the wall. Um, the anxiety in not just Chinese markets, but in Hong Kong and also in, in the West is that Evergrande's um, liabilities are spread pretty widely internationally. Uh, and if they defaulted on their uh, debts, which they're apparently about to do, uh, this is going to have very considerable ripple effects through the world economy. But it says something about the way the Chinese are managing their economy, that they're willing to say to a big, effectively bankrupt property company, you've got to go down, we're not going to bail you out. Um, All right. Um, we have another question from, um, I can't see quite the name, is it from Peter? It is from Peter. Another question from Peter that goes back to uh, the Australia, uh, UK, US um, uh, announcement. Uh, Peter asks, don't the 14 demands made by China on Australia demonstrate that China wants to go beyond playing a Davos China type of role? The list suggests that China does want to export its anti-democratic values and specifically referring, I believe, Peter, to uh, the uh, the tensions between China and Australia that have led China to essentially uh, blackball um, Australia. Um, yes, well, Australia has just, you know, been a bit provocative. Um, the Chinese have, you know, overreacted, I think, considerably overreacted, uh, and have demonstrated one of the less attractive features of the Chinese regime, which is to use economic measures uh, against countries which they think are um, attacking them politically. Um, there is a contrast between um, Australia and New Zealand. New, New Zealand has opted for a more emollient relationship with China. Um, they've had issues um, with, I think, a couple of spies and so on. But um, there is this idea that the best course of action is engagement. Uh, and that may reflect the ideological difference between New Zealand and Australia. The Australians have adopted a much more um, aggressive approach, verbally aggressive approach, and the Chinese have retaliated in kind. Of course, when this started, it had nothing to do with arguments about democracy. It was because Australia um, started pressing for um, an inquisition on what had happened to the COVID, um, the COVID uh, ep epidemic. And the questions they asked, the Australians asked, were perfectly reasonable, actually. But they were put in a, in a, in a very forceful way, and the Chinese reacted accordingly. So I, I, the way the Chinese react to countries varies from one thing to another. Uh, say their relations with New Zealand are very good. With Australia, they've been very bad until now. The relationship with the UK have been very good, but they're turning very bad, and we may find ourselves with the same kind of reactions that the Australians have had. Let's talk about something that happened quite recently actually here in the UK that may be a sign of that deteriorating relationship. Uh, the new, relatively new Chinese ambassador to the UK was invited to a reception hosted by the all party parliamentary group on China uh, in, in that was set to take place in parliament. And um, sort of at the last minute, the day before the speaker, uh, you know, uninvited the ambassador or made clear that the event should not take place. Uh, and, and the reason for that is a couple of months ago now, uh, the Chinese government imposed sanctions on several members of parliament who've been very vocal about some of the issues that we've talked about ourselves in this conversation, um, human rights, et cetera. 
and um, and that has escalated, obviously, with with uh, quite angry statements made by Chinese officials. So, do you think that this is sort of a sign um, of where the relationship is going? Do you think this is this will blow over? What what's your assessment of that? Well, well, first of all, I I wouldn't criticize the speaker at all. I mean, his job is to protect the interests of parliamentarians, uh, MPs, and lords, and if they um, you know, if they've been badly treated by a foreign government, you'd expect the Speaker of Parliament to stick up for them. So I, you know, I would defend what he did. And had I been Speaker, I might well have done the same thing. But I wouldn't see that as a an interstate issue, though the Chinese may interpret it that way. I think the, the much more um, relevant to the sort of the deterioration of the relationship. I think it started with the Huawei decision. Uh, well, we had very good relations with Huawei, we did a perfectly sensible compromise, and then the British, uh, under pressure, um, decided to exclude them altogether for political reasons. And I think that was the, the, the point at which uh, things went really very bad. And there have been a whole series of pinpricks ever since, and joining this uh, Australian-American alliance um, hasn't helped. Um, but I don't think the episode with the speaker in itself is significant. And I would certainly defend what he did. I'll bring in a uh, member of the audience now so you all can hear something other than my voice for a minute. Um, Barry James, uh, if you're here, Barry, asks an interesting question about digital currency. Perhaps you can uh, ask Vince your question directly. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, um, Great to be here. Thank you, Vince. Uh, the question is, uh, most, as you probably know, most of the world's central banks are now working on their own digital currency, the, ours being, having been dubbed the Britcoin, as you know, uh, while China is rolling theirs out right now, calling it <clears throat> tests, but they're rolling it out. Um, along with a modern trade platform, you know, Amazon plus PayPal on steroids, uh, and is likely to do in the future across the Belt and Road countries. There's 140 of them, I think. Um, so they're years, there's some years ahead of the West, really. And the, 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 Fed, the Fed have been dragging their feet, but they're falling into line now and, and, and so on. My question is, will this be a major geopolitical battleground in this next phase, this next era? And if so, is that better than the alternatives? Uh, well, as, as you correctly say, um, in the digital sector, the um, Chinese have been in some ways uh, ahead of the West. It's particularly true of payment systems and um, e-commerce e re retailing. They've, they've been somewhat ahead of us. Um, I, I would personally wouldn't read too much into this new uh, Chinese cryptocurrency. Um, it is very much under state control. This is not, of course, what the crypto enthusiasts want to see. Um, and this is not like this rather bizarre experiment in El Salvador, where it's been created as a, an alternative currency, where the alternative is the dollar and is fully convertible. Ch the Chinese currency is not convertible. Um, it, they're quite strict capital controls. Um, and that's not going to change. So I, I think the, the basic idea is that they want to have the advantages of cryptocurrency, but they want to keep it very much under state control. Uh, and that's um, that's a more, I mean, you know, in a way we're going down the same route. I mean, there is a move in the UK and the US to uh, more tightly regulate um, crypto markets, um, platforms like Ethereum and so on are, uh, being subject to tougher regulation than in China. The, it's, it's absolutely clear that the state wants to have this under lock and key. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, obviously, the, the central bank digital currencies, uh, you know, the digital pound is very different to the Bitcoin and, and, and so on. Um, and, and uh, you know, it, it, it does seem that uh, this this could be part of the, the, the geopolitical situation. That's That really was my question. Thank you, Barry. And I think, yeah, there we go. We have Vince. Thank you so much for your question. Um, so Vince, I will ask you a question now well, about... Oh. 
Uh, sorry, the, the, I was just interjecting if that not if that's allowed. That was yeah, just course, I thought a very interesting comment. Hello, are, are you with me? Yeah. I can hear you. Uh, the, the, I think just an interesting observation about the geopolitics of money. Uh, I think one of the things which we've always taken for granted over the last 20 years is the way in which you've had this um, close, you know, symbiotic relationship between the United States and China in relation to money, finance. The, the Americans have run very large deficits um, on the budget and the current account. And this has finished up in the form of very large uh, dollar reserves in China. Now, a lot of hawks used to say, well, you know, the Chinese are going to destroy our capitalist economy. Of course, the Chinese never did because they would have devalued their own, um, uh, own assets. And it, I think that's a very good example of how mutual interests um, in, in, in money, in this case, prevailed over, you know, geopolitical um, interference. And I think, I think, in essence, that's the way we have to see our relations with China. So I'm going to bring in another theme now, if you don't mind, Barry, um, about uh, China or Chinese companies' involvement in the UK's nuclear sector. I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, specifically, um, how do you think that China would react if, uh, after government assessments were made, uh, they decided, in fact, to get rid of uh, Chinese money and technology in various nuclear power plant projects that are being developed here in the UK? Um, obviously, that could very well happen. I think uh, there's been signs of that recently. So do we need Chinese money and technology for these projects? What would be your view if it were terminated? Well, I, actually, I suspect this is something that wouldn't be a problem for them. I think they're desperate to get out of the Hinkley project, which is shaping up as a big disaster. Um, I mean, the, my recollection of the origins of this uh, was that the Chinese were interested in investing in Bradwell, which is one of the projects down the way down the pipeline. Um, and there are, the, the, the aim was to try out in a Western context uh, their particular model of reactor, which is apparently, although it is said, um, safe and economically efficient. And they were going to use it as a, as a model for exporting their nuclear technology. Um, the British government responded by saying, well, if you want to get involved in it, uh, we want you to show your good faith by putting... Um, an equity investment into uh, Hinkley, which currently depends on EDF, the French company. Um, as, as Hinkley has turned sour, um, the, the Chinese are potentially going to lose a lot of money. Uh, I'm, the sense I get is they want out, uh, and they don't realistically expect in this currently rather poisonous atmosphere that, that Bradwell involvement will be welcomed. So I, it, was, uh, it was pushing the boat out a little bit to get them in the nuclear sector at all. And I, I don't think they will persist with it. So what kind of investment do you think that Chinese companies are still interested in when it comes to the UK? Uh, there's a lot of talk at the government level of trying to determine which sectors are sensitive versus not, not just for Chinese investors, but foreign investors in general. Um, so which... Which targets do you think that Chinese companies are still interested? Which of them do you think have sort of survived the politicization of the relationship? Well, the, the original interest of China in investing in the UK um, was, I think, basically twofold. I, I dealt with them fairly extensively in the earlier part of the decade. The first was that they saw Britain as a kind of entry point to the European Union and the single market. If you had a plant in Britain, it could export to Europe. Well, of course, that's now gone. Um, they miscalculated and they assumed, like um, the British elite, that Brexit wasn't going to happen. And uh, it has. But that was, I think, their primary motivation. And the second was um, a growing interest, uh, which has now waned. But there was a lot of interest a few years ago in trying to make the renminbi, the Chinese currency, a global currency to compete with the euro and the yen and the dollar. 
um, and th they haven't advanced as far as they hoped in that respect, but they were hoping the City of London would help them provide a, um, a market in which um, renminbi products could be developed and a little bit's happened but not very much um, the, the other things that they've got into of course is the big steel works in south wales that probably wouldn't now be open were it not for the chinese investment uh, and undoubtedly some of their companies are looking for high-tech acquisitions in order to get access to the technology and there was a a plant in Newport in South Wales so it's dealing with one aspect of semiconductors and they were clearly aiming to, to get hold of their technology and I, I think you know we do need to have effective screening um, of our high-tech industries not just for the Chinese but but more generally they've, they've um, disappeared abroad far too easily. Right and that particular uh, attempted or, or probable takeover uh, that you had just mentioned uh, is under investigation by the government. So clearly, you know, some of these transactions are, are very much well, political. That's quite, that's quite reasonable. That's quite reasonable. Mm. Had I been Secretary of State, I would have wanted to review it as well. Mm. Right. So I'll bring in uh, one more of our audience uh, members who had a good question, an interesting question about um, situations in which China uses its economic weight uh, to uh, achieve a particular political outcome or, or in a way uh, fight back against a country that does something that they don't particularly like. He mentions the case of China boycotting Norwegian salmon uh, after the Nobel Committee there awarded uh, its prize to a Chinese dissident. So Ian, I wonder if you could come in uh, and ask Vince a more elaborate question, uh, version of the question that I just previewed. Certainly, yes. Um, I, I, I mean, uh, so, so I think the Norwegian case is maybe the paradigm case, uh, but there are a number of other examples too, where um, China is obviously an economic superpower uh, and its, its ability to fuse its, uh, its, its economic might with uh, geopolitical aims uh, is really quite profound and worrying because some of those aims uh, differ from our own aims. So the Norwegian case is one where um, obviously we would hope that the, no the Nobel Prize Committee uh, awards their uh, their awards in exactly the way they want, uh, and so they shouldn't be deterred from giving it to a Chinese dissident in that case. Uh, but there have been a number of other cases, such as a, a, a boycott or an economic move against uh, British cloth, uh, British uh, uh, cloth manufacturers after some words in Hong Kong, and other cases too. So, so one is uh, I'm presuming you you recognise that's a bad thing that they're throwing their economic weight around to achieve uh, objectives we don't like and don't, don't want them to do. And secondly, what can we do about it? So. The obvious response is some sort of deterrence. Can we respond in kind if they boycott Norwegian salmon and we all rally around the Norwegians by everybody boycotting something Chinese? Or what is the response to that? What should it be? Thank you. Well, if we're talking about international trade, then we should, of course, get the Chinese operating within the World Trade Organization and operating according to agreed norms. Of course, we should. Um, uh, I think ultimately, actually, that is part of their aspiration and the fact that Trump walked away from the international trading system, uh, set the value system of the West and its credibility back a long way. Um, but yeah, we want the Chinese to operate according to rules um, and a rules based system. And if they go against that, we, we would want to uh, Western countries to act with solidarity, of course. But I think we shouldn't be too pious about this. I mean, China isn't the only country that uses economic measures to enforce its political will. It's very, very difficult for um, British companies to trade with Iran or Cuba, for example, um, because they then get caught up with extraterritorial um, action by the United States, which is, you know, using economic levers to force political change in those countries. So the Chinese are, aren't the only people who do it, but they do it rather crudely um, in a way that I think actually is rather damaging their interests. Thank you. That's great. Okay, so we have roughly five or four minutes left now. Um, I wonder, Vince, if we can just wrap this up with a couple of words from you on your book, uh, if you can tell the audience members who haven't had a chance to read it yet, uh, why they should, and, uh, and what's in it. 
Um, well, the, the book was inspired not by expertise. I'm not a China expert. I haven't lived there. I don't speak the Chinese language. But um, it, was in, it was inspired by curiosity and a wish to try to pull together all the different arguments which are floating around about China and to try to make sense of them. Um, hoping that the UK can get into a somewhat more constructive position than it is at the moment. So a, a lot of my book is dealing with the economic context, um, why China is important simply because of its size and increasingly its technological sophistication and where those two things are heading. Um, you know, on existing trends, you know, China is going to become overwhelmingly the largest economic superpower in the world. Certainly it's a parity with the United States. Um, I then look at the relevance of the economy in terms of China itself. The legitimacy of the regime in, in China depends on economic success, lifting people out of poverty, lifting living standards. It's done that extremely well, but there are question marks which we discussed here as to how far that, that, that can now continue. And, but, but the heart of the book, um, it, towards the, the end, through those scenarios which you touched on, is to, to address the question about how we should deal with China. Should we treat them as an enemy, as a threat? Um, they're certainly a competitor and a threat in some respects. But I believe that if, if we, we back away too far from engagement, an attempted engagement, uh, we, first of all, are in danger of losing massive economic opportunities and also failing to deal with some of the big international uh, public good issues in economic jargon. And of course, climate change, um, nuclear proliferation, pandemics, uh, aid to Africa, which you know China is now as a bigger donor investor in Africa than we are. And unless we get, unless we manage to cooperate with them, which is not going to be easy, but I think we've got to try, um, these problems are just not going to be addressed, let alone solved. And on that note, I'll bring in one last comment from the audience because uh, it snuck in there at the last minute and I, I find it uh, thought provoking. Uh, Simon Mundy compliments you on your measured analysis, um, but uh, finds issue with your conclusions. Uh, he says, we cannot cons constantly cite equivalence, uh, meaning our bad behavior versus China's bad behavior, as the reason why we should accept certain policies on the part of the country. Uh, what is your response to that? Um, no, they're not equivalent. We, you know, we, we have a, a democratic system and we're, we're proud of it. And we have our system of laws and rights and we should be proud of it. Uh, but, but what greatly weakens uh, our authority in terms of arguing uh, with the Chinese is when we have sort of basic hypocrisy. Um, when we, you know, the British government, for example, in, in, in Hong Kong, uh, denounces the Chinese for breaking the treaty, whereas at the same time, we're saying to the world, uh, that we're not going to implement our European treaties because sovereignty should take precedence over um, international law, which of course the Chinese approach. So, you know, we've got to be more consistent and more honest. And on human rights, I mean, having an ethical foreign policy is, a, is, a, is wonderful if we can do it. Um, I fear it may have died with Robin Cook. Um, having a consistent ethical foreign policy uh, which applies roughly similar standards to Saudi Arabia, China, um, Turkey, which is still in NATO, and uh, Egypt and many other countries with appalling human rights records, is very, very difficult. Um, and simply singling out China for criticism while turning a blind eye to other countries that we want to cultivate, um, just, um, just it's not credible. Uh, and is undermining our moral authority. So I'm, I, I, I'm not applying um, you know, inconsistent standards here. I'm just asking for a bit of honesty in the way we, we deal with the Chinese. All right, well, thank you so much, Vince. And thank you to those in our audience who stuck with us this long. I'm going to hand this back to Ben. And uh, Annabelle, can I just say thank you for sharing that absolutely brilliantly, particularly with one hand 
tied behind your back. What uh, everybody else can't see is that Annabelle can't see the chat. So she and I have been frantically sending messages and relaying that. And she's managed to, to read all of your comments and seamlessly throw questions whilst listening to Vince. So thank you, uh, Annabelle. And thank you, Vince, for um, a really fascinating discussion. And it feels like a very radixy discussion because uh, there is lots of disagreement here but it's very civil disagreement and you make your arguments in such a thoughtful and thought provoking way that I have no doubt we'll continue this discussion, I hope in a very civil fashion. Um, can I do two quick adverts? Firstly, um, buy the book. You'll have seen my colleague uh, Trin posting earlier in the chat, right at the beginning of the chat, uh, how you can get hold of it and how you can get hold of it as at a discount if you uh, order now or at least before the end of the week. And if you're not sold on it now, I don't know when you will be. Second, by the think tank. We um, have uh, uh, entertained you, I hope, for free. Um, but if you feel that you want to uh, make a contribution, why not sign up to becoming a, a friend of Radix, which in fact you can now do with our partner, uh, which is Big Tent. You'll find uh, Big Tent friends on bigtent.org.uk. One of my colleagues will post the website address in the chat now, but bigtent.org.uk and become a friend. And that supports all of the work that we do. Lastly, just to say, you know, this is a topic we will be returning to uh, because it continues to generate more interest and more people than anything else we do. And if you would like to be part of that debate, we carry a daily blog on our website and we welcome contributions from our supporters, 300, 700 words, send it through to me and we'd be delighted to find an opportunity to publish. Thanks again to everyone. And I wish you all uh, a very good evening and see you soon. Bye. Bye.